Chairman, uh, that was an interesting exchange, and, and I, uh, I appreciate my colleague from California's uh, uh, conversation. And, and I'm, uh, I'm open to, to what he's saying about a, uh, a fee because I think China is an exceptional case. I think what the Chamber of Commerce may be concerned about, however, is that uh, this kind of a policy, this kind of protectionist policy could evolve into uh, something uh, beyond China and that uh, could be used even in cases where we have reciprocal free trade agreements with allies and partners. That I think would be a mistake. Uh, I do not believe that we should try to counter China by imitating Chinese industrial policy. The, the advantage that we have in our country is that we're capitalists. We do believe in free and reciprocal trade, not with China because China is an exceptional case and they don't engage in free trade. But I think it would be a mistake to try to copy Chinese industrial policies because that actually is the best way to misallocate resources. Free markets are the answer in our competition with China generally. Let me uh, ask Dr. Miller a question about Taiwan and semiconductors in Taiwan. I was recently in Taiwan with a bipartisan delegation and we were able to tour uh, the very uh, uh, impressive semiconductor capabilities there. We uh, visited TSMC. Uh, I think they have 30 percent of global market share of advanced semiconductor chips, the chips that power artificial intelligence. Um, we had the opportunity to ask the chairman of TSMC about a Taiwan invasion scenario. And he was very direct. He said an invasion of the island would uh, take us down instantaneously. Paint a picture for the American people, for the people watching, my constituents, why Taiwan matters, Dr. Miller. What would happen to the average American consumer uh, and Americans' access to chips in the event of an invasion? Representative, thank you for the question. During the pandemic, when there were relatively minor chip shortages, we saw a experiment in real time as to just how costly that would be. I mentioned in my testimony, the auto industry alone faced hundreds of billions of dollars in cars that couldn't be sold because they couldn't source chips. And it wasn't just autos, it was tractors, it was hearing aids, it was across the uh, manufacturing sector of the economy. And that was at a time when there were minor disruptions. As you said, Taiwan is the world's most important producer of chips, especially when it comes to the most advanced chips. And so for phones, computers, telecoms infrastructure, certainly any artificial intelligence application, we would face enormous delays, uh, huge inflation uh, as a result of any disruption to the chip production in Taiwan. Well, I think that's uh, why we, we need deterrence with Taiwan. Um, and we also need to uh, have supply chain resiliency and build out our, our, our uh, 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 diversification of access to chips beyond China. Um, Mr. Paul, let me ask you about Subic Bay and shipbuilding. Um, when I was in Subic Bay, we spoke to Cerberus about their decision to buy the shipyard. Uh, and the State Department touted the success of an American company purchasing this critical infrastructure. But we also saw how much the shipyard and port is underutilized, and Cerberus expressed concern that they were not making returns on investment. How can the United States government actively encourage or help U.S. companies invest in the capabilities at Subic? And can Subic be uh, part, of the, part of the answer to our shipbuilding capabilities and part of the deterrence strategy uh, in the Western Pacific. Yeah, Mr. Barr, I'm glad you raised up that question because I do believe that there are possibilities that this isn't a, this is not a hopeless case and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. The idea behind just going back to the fee is that it would provide a revenue source to have some investment in new technology, in port upgrades, and in workforce training that we're going to need to scale up. Is that we're, we're at such a breaking point now. We have a very fragile supply chain in shipbuilding. We've lost 20,500 suppliers in the shipbuilding sector over the last two decades. And so we need it to be agile, and that is going to take some investment. Uh, again, uh, I, yes, I do believe that we should operate as a free market whenever possible. Even Adam Smith suggested shipbuilding is a yep. unique case and that you need to find revenue sources to support your development. And can I say, Mr. Paul, I, I appreciate your testimony. I appreciate uh, the, the comments uh, from my friend from California, Mr. Khanna, and I'm open to that, but I want to make sure it's limited to China. 
I think it would be a mistake to broaden that and a source of revenue to revitalize our shipbuilding capacity, great, I'm for it. But let's not let that evolve into an overly broad industrial policy uh, that limits uh, uh, free trade with allies and partners. That's my point. Now, t tell me about Subic uh, uh, and Cerberus. And, and we need to get back into, into Subic Bay. And it, does that present some shipbuilding opportunities with the Philippines? Yeah, it, it may. Uh, let me respond for the record since I have seen up time, but I'd be happy to explicate more of that uh, in, in, in a written response. Thanks so much. I yield.